This is possibly the best thing I've ever put in my pantry. Come along and find out what it is. Hey guys, it's Jarrah with Wicked Prepared. I'm getting there guys, huh? You know, you guys were all so great after my last video. So many of you offered me your suggestions, your cures, your remedies for my laryngitis. And I've been implementing so many of your suggestions and it really is helping. You can see my voice is much better than it was, but I'm still not 100%. So I thought what I would do for this weekend's video is to use some clips that I had already filmed previously before I got sick so that I won't have to use my voice as much. A few months ago, I got a really good deal on some boneless, skinless chicken thighs which is something that we use a lot of. When there's a good sale, I usually buy extra to freeze, but this time I bought even more because I was planning on canning some. But I got to thinking, you know, I don't think I really need a lot more canned chicken thigh meat. I really usually reach for the breast meat a lot more if I'm using plain canned chicken meat. And I definitely didn't have room in my freezer for all that chicken. So I started thinking about some of the dishes that I usually use these thighs in. One of our favorite dinners to make with boneless, skinless chicken thighs is crock pot teriyaki chicken. Everyone in the family loves this dish. My brain started going into overdrive and I thought about trying to can this recipe so that we would have it all ready to go on the shelf as a complete meal in a jar. So I canned up one batch to try it out and guys, it came out amazing. Honestly, we liked it even better than we do when it's made in the crock pot. You see, the problem with the original version in the crock pot is that it tastes amazing, but the presentation isn't all that impressive. Being done in the crock pot, the sauce doesn't get that rich, dark look to it. But being done in the pressure canner, that was not the case. The sauce came out rich and dark with a little bit more depth of flavor. When I tasted it, I knew that it was a keeper. In fact, it was the best meal in a jar that I've ever canned. So the next time I found an amazing sale on the same chicken, I bought a whole bunch so that I could can up more for our shelves and take you guys all along and show you how I did it. Now I will caution you one thing, I tried this in quarts next because I figured we all really like this dish and a pint's not gonna feed all of us, but in the quart jar with the longer processing time, I felt like the sauce got a bit of a burnt flavor to it, which can happen when you pressure can things with sugar in them. It was still pretty good, and Mr. Wicked Prepared said if he had only had that one, he would have thought it was just fine. He never would have noticed, but having them both back to back, he did notice that there was a difference. So I've decided that it's better to can it up in just pints, and then just open more than one pint if we need more. I did end up making a double batch to can this time because that's the perfect amount to fill up my stovetop canner. The single batch that I made the first time was perfect to fill up my electric Nesco pressure canner. And if you have a larger canner or you run more than one canner at a time, you could certainly do a triple batch, a quadruple batch, or whatever you want, but I do recommend sticking to the pint jars. My second caution here is that I'm not really sure if this would be considered rebel canning or not. Obviously, I didn't follow what would be considered a tested and approved recipe because I just canned up my own recipe. But to the best of my knowledge, there's nothing in this recipe that shouldn't be canned. So honestly, I don't think this is rebel canning, but I did just want to put that out there. Um, at the end of the day, we all have to make our own judgment calls about what we can in our own kitchens and how we do it. So let's go ahead and get started, and I will show you how I canned up this delicious chicken teriyaki. So this is all of the chicken that I got um, in the sale. I did not put 12 packs. I didn't buy this all at once. I went one day and bought six packs and figured I would go back um, towards the end of the sale and see what they had left, and they had a whole bunch left. So I got another six packs, $1.37 a pound. For my area, this is an amazing price for boneless, skinless thighs. I have not seen a price like this in quite a while. So what I ended up with here is almost 40 pounds of chicken and I paid just over $50 for it. So I was really happy with that. I find it kind of disturbing that eggs are so expensive and so hard to come by nowadays, but I seem to be finding the best chicken sales for chicken meat that I've ever seen in my life. So what does that tell you? <laughs> so what I've done here is I've written out um, the ingredients that I usually use. Then the ingredients are listed here in the middle and on the left hand side is what I usually do for one batch in my crock pot if I'm just making this normally. And so I doubled all the ingredients and I wrote those amounts over here. And the one substitution is that I'm substituting clear gel for the cornstarch. So 
This is gonna help me keep things straight so that I don't mess up on the recipe as I'm doubling it. And I think that we'll probably make this into a printable for anyone who wants to try this at home. Um, it'll be all ready to be printed out for you to follow along with and include in your binder. Now I included the clear gel because I want my sauce to be thick and ready to serve when I open the jar. Some people will thicken dishes like this after um, canning before they serve it they'll thicken it with cornstarch. I just don't want to have that additional step. I prefer my food to be thickened and ready to eat right out of the jar. So I'm going to start by mixing up the sauce and I'm going to just do it in this bowl right here. We're going to start with our soy sauce and our sugar. Now it calls for a low sodium soy sauce and I'm sure you could use either one because I've used a little, I've never done it with fully um, regular soy sauce. I usually use the low sodium just because that's what the original recipe called for. We liked it the first time we made it so we just stick with it. But once I used up my bottle of low sodium and instead of opening another bottle I just used some regular and that came out fine as well. So I'm sure whichever one you wanted would be fine. It would just be a little bit more salty if you use the regular soy sauce. That bottle's empty so I'm going to go ahead with a new bottle. I do find for me the cheapest low sodium soy sauce I can find is usually at Walmart. They do sell on Amazon a large gallon jug of the Kikamon brand I believe but it's still cheaper per ounce um, for me to get this one at Walmart and I just get multiple bottles because we do go through quite a bit of it since this is one of our favorite recipes. So there's one cup. I need a cup and a half. So I'm going to go ahead and put that in my bowl. Get another half a cup. And then the next ingredient is going to be sugar. We're going to be doing a cup and a half of sugar. And I just keep my sugar in this, um, this big Tupperware or um, Rubbermaid, whatever this is. I've got some clumps, but it's fine. They will dissolve. So we're going to do a cup and a half. And next I'm going to add three quarters of a cup of apple cider vinegar. Now I know it looks like this jug of apple cider vinegar is older than the hills from the label here, but I just keep refilling this jar over and over again out of a larger jug. So that's why this is so old. It's not really old vinegar. I just refilled it actually. Okay, so three quarters of a cup of the apple cider vinegar. That's the same as 12 tablespoons because the original recipe calls for six tablespoons and we are doubling this. I'm going to go ahead and just whisk this a little bit to just start the sugar dissolving into the rest of the liquid. Now I'm going to go ahead and add ground ginger. Um, this is, is my ginger dispenser. It's almost empty in here. I don't know if you can see it's almost empty but I'm going to get what I can out of here and then when I'm done with that I do have um, another large um, bulk container that I can refill this with but let's see if we can get a teaspoon and a half is all we need so now six clicks of this dial is going to be a teaspoon and a half because each click is a quarter teaspoon but because it's almost empty, I think a couple of those last rounds were a little bit shy, so I'm going to go ahead and give it a couple more clicks. And next we need two tablespoons of minced garlic. I like to use the squeezy garlic, but I've started getting this um, because it's a little bit cheaper. There's one tablespoon, two tablespoons. You can never have too much garlic in my opinion. I love garlic. I always add more than what the recipe calls for. So next we just need a half a teaspoon of black pepper. I'm going to go ahead and give this a little whisk. Just start to break up all these um, seasonings and everything and get this all mixed together. And then the final ingredient that we need for our sauce is going to be clear gel. Now clear gel is just like a modified form of cornstarch. It's um, what you're supposed to use for canning in place of cornstarch, flour, things like that. It's supposed to hold up to the heat better and be a little bit safer for canning. I know there's plenty of people who have used cornstarch in their canning for years and had no issues. So if you do use cornstarch, you can go ahead and try that. I haven't tried it with cornstarch in the canner, but I had the clear gel already. So I figured I would just go ahead and use that. I get this off of Amazon. This is like what you would use for canned pie filling and things like that. We're going to use a half a cup of the clear gel 
and be generous be a little generous in the half a cup I kind of let it mound over a little bit because I like my sauce pretty thick I don't um, I don't you know smooth it right off in the top so I'm gonna go ahead and put in the half a cup of clear gel this is kind of messy it does kind of uh, get powder all over the place but and then I'm gonna go ahead and get this all whisked in as well Just whisk it until there aren't any more clumps. Try to get down off the sides, which you can. We want to get this all into our sauce and not waste any of it. If you have little clumps, you can always break them up with um, the tines of your whisk against the edge of the bowl. They will eventually dissolve, but you want to make sure that everything is um, thoroughly combined before we get it into the canner. We don't want to have any clumps when it's going into the canner. So now you can see that this is pretty well combined. Any clumps that I see in here now are just the chunks of garlic from the minced garlic. So this is pretty well combined. So I'm going to go ahead and set this aside while I cut up my chicken and get my jars ready. But I'm going to keep the whisk with this and I'm going to keep the whisk handy because um, as I go, I'm going to whisk this again before I get started putting it into the jars. And I sometimes will whisk it periodically as I'm filling the jars just because I want to make sure that everything stays combined. I don't want things kind of separating. I don't want the sugar or the, the clear gel or anything to fall down to the bottom, you know, anything to float up to the top. I just like to keep it well combined to make sure that every jar is going to get an equal amount of all the ingredients. So before I get started, I'm going to start by putting a little bit of sauce in my jars before I start cutting up my chicken. Now I've got eight jars here because I found that one batch fills four pint jars. And I'm doing two batches, so I've got eight pint jars here. My jars are clean. They're cold. We're going to do cold packing here, so everything's going to go in the jars cold, and the jars are going to go in the can or cold. Now, I did measure out, and one batch of sauce makes just under two cups of the sauce. So, therefore, each jar should have, give or take, around half a cup of sauce in it total, maybe just under half a cup. And so I'm going to give the sauce a whisk here just one more time to make sure that it's well blended. And what I found to work well is this little uh, uh, ladle. I got this little ladle. It's made out of silicone. I got this from um, Walmart. It was very inexpensive. It's very small. I think it holds about two tablespoons. They probably have something like this at Dollar Tree as well. And I found that this worked very well um, for dividing the sauce up into the jars. I put one scoop in the bottom, one ladle full in the bottom, and then I put um, some chicken in about halfway, and then I put another one ladle full. And then at the end when the jar is about as full as I want it, a little bit under full, I add usually it's about two more ladlefuls and just evenly divide it between the jars. So each jar gets about four of these small ladlefuls. And then if the jar isn't quite as full as I want it, we're going to be leaving about an inch and a half of headspace. If it's not quite as um, full as I want it, I can add a little bit of extra chicken to bring it up to that level. So I'm going to start by putting one ladle full of sauce into each of these jars. And I am not using my canning funnel on this because it's just a lot of work to move it, you know, from jar to jar. I find the way that I'm doing this because I'm filling each jar um, a little bit at a time. I'm not filling one jar completely and then moving on to the next jar. So I didn't use my canning funnel. I haven't used it on these yet. And I can pretty well keep the rims clean, but I'm going to clean them before I seal them up anyways. So I don't worry about it. So I'm going to go ahead and put one ladle full into each of these jars. All right, so there's one scoop into every jar. I'm going to go ahead and just wipe that up. I spilled a little bit there. And now I'm going to get my chicken. I'm going to start cutting my chicken and I'm just going to put it into each jar as I go. So what I found when I've done this recipe before is that um, one batch, so four jars, um, uses just about three pounds of chicken, give or take. And I end up cutting, I'm using chicken thighs, and I end up cutting each thigh into four to six pieces, give or take. Now if you find big chunks of fat on the meat, you can cut the big chunks off, but I'm not going to worry about any, you know, little bits of fat. You drive yourself crazy trying to get all the fat off of these chicken thighs. So I put about one thigh into the jar. See this right here is a chunk of fat that I would probably try to cut off. Thighs do have quite a bit of fat, but it's okay. So 
So each thigh in four to six pieces and then I'm putting them in the jar. I'm gonna fill each jar a little bit less than half. So it's gonna be about one thigh in each jar and then I'm gonna go ahead and add more sauce. Now once again, um, a big chunk of fat like this, you can go ahead and try to get that off of there. All right, so each of my jars is a little less than half full. I'm gonna go ahead and wash my hands so that I can go um, through and put another scoop of the juice, um, the sauce, in each jar. All right, so I'm gonna give this another little whisk just to make sure it's all blended. And I'm just gonna go ahead and give one more ladle full into each jar. All right, so I'm just gonna continue on with the chicken the way that I've been going. We're gonna be generous with the headspace on these and go around an inch and a half, but I'm gonna go fill them a little bit less than that because then we're gonna add the rest of the sauce and then we can adjust with more chicken if we need to. Now you notice I'm not packing them too terribly tight because I wanna leave room for the liquid to sort of filter in between the pieces of meat. And then I'm gonna debubble this at the end and really work the sauce into all the pockets between the meat. All right, so now I've got these um, just about as full as I'm gonna want them. We're gonna adjust in a little bit. I'm gonna go wash my hands one more time. All right, so I've got these all filled. Now, my biggest like headspace measuring tool only goes down to an inch, so we need about an inch and a quarter, a little bit more, so you kinda have to guesstimate, but it's gonna be below the bottom, um, but it's gonna be below this bottom um, uh, lip here, whatever you wanna call this. Now I'm gonna go ahead and clean my jars. Because I didn't use my funnel and I know I made a mess, I'm gonna clean these um, you know, a little bit more thoroughly than I normally would. I've already gone ahead and wiped all the outside of the jars and now I'm gonna get my super hot water and I'm gonna clean the rims. I don't do vinegar anymore because I found um, it doesn't seem to be necessary and there's some controversy and debate about whether or not that can affect your seals and I have not been using vinegar for a while and I haven't had any issues. so. I'm gonna go ahead and get my very hot water and I'm gonna wipe the rims and get my lids on these so we can get these in the canner. Now while I'm waiting for the water to heat up that I'm gonna to use to clean my rims, I do have my canner on the stove behind me and I've got the water in it. You're gonna to wanna to follow the instructions for your canner that your canner came with for the amount of water because it's different for every brand. I have a Presto, so it's three quarts of water. But I've got cold water in the canner and my canner is not um, turned on. It's not heating because we cold pack this. So we wanna keep everything the same temperature. We wanna make sure that if the jars are cold, then the canner is cold and the water in the canner is cold. Otherwise we're gonna um, have the possibility of thermal shock and breaking our jars. Likewise, I'm also gonna start the heat pretty slowly when I start the canner and bring it up to temperature and pressure slowly just to avoid shocking the jars and because that helps to cut down on siphoning usually if you keep things gradual. The one thing that I have started doing with my canner is I've started putting um, cream of tartar in the water instead of vinegar. This is a trick that I just recently learned. It does the same um, job that the vinegar does as far as keeping any kind of a film from uh, forming on your jars if you have hard water or anything, but it also actually um, makes your canner look better. It kind of cleans it and improves it as opposed to the vinegar that can make it dark and pitted and all that. So, so I've just been adding the cream of tartar to my canner, to the water in my canner. Um, about a heaping teaspoon is what I put in um, my pressure canner. So I just have hot water from my electric kettle in a little cup here. And I'm just gonna be using that to clean the rims of the jars. It's very, very hot water. It was boiling hot. And I'm just using a clean cloth and wiping the rims. And then every time I do a new jar, I move to a different spot on the cloth just to make sure that I'm not transferring anything from jar to jar or anything like that. Because I already did a precursory wipe on these once, they shouldn't be too dirty. There shouldn't really be 
much to transfer but it's just good to be extra sure that you're not going to have anything on the rims that could interfere with your seal okay. all right so these are all clean now when i'm pressure canning i no longer simmer my lids or anything like that um, i just make sure that i have clean lids i don't simmer them i do still simmer my lids when i'm water bathing usually i don't know why i just do um, i'm still using some ball lids because i have some to use up and i have some a lot of new jars that have you know came with lids already so i'm using up my ball lids as long as i use my band tightening tool to tighten my bands i generally don't have problems with them sealing but if you have had problems with your lid sealing because i know there's a lot of people who have been complaining about the ball lids so if you have had issues with them then um, a couple other brands of lids I've been buying. I've stopped buying new ball lids unless they come with my jars. I've started buying um, four jars and Superb. Those are two brands that are um, pretty well known to be to be really dependable and to be a little bit better than the ball lids now are. I mean, the ball lids used to be fine, but there have been some changes. So I will put a link. I buy them from Azure Standard because they have really good prices on them. You can buy them in bulk. So I'll have a link to those down in the description in case you need um, a, a good source for lids. But I just get my rings on loosely and then I use my band tightening tool to tighten them to exactly um, the tightness that they're supposed to be. So you see you just tighten it until you see this arrow and this arrow you just tighten it until those arrows match up and then you're done. I'm going to go ahead and put this in my canner. This tool just kind of takes the mystery out of the term finger tight. I think that's where a lot of people go wrong and why a lot of people have issues with their jars. Sealing is because finger tight um, can be different for every person. Nobody seems to really understand what that means. So this tool was made by Ball um, to tighten to it precisely what they mean um, by finger tight. Now I have a lot of people ask me for the link for this tool. Now Ball used to make this and they no longer make it. So this isn't made anymore. So if you're lucky, you might find one at a yard sale, check yard sales, estate sales, auctions, things like that. I got mine off of eBay. They are sold on Amazon and eBay, but you know how it goes on eBay and on Amazon with the third party sellers. The prices can really vary depending on who's selling it and what they're asking for it. So I can link to this on both Amazon and eBay, I believe, as long as I can find it. But the price is going to vary depending on who, who's selling it. So you're going to want to keep an eye on it or at least just use the link um, to go find one and then you, it'll show you others that are being offered by other people, you know, down in the bottom of the listing and you can check and see if there's anything um, cheaper at the moment. But I did pay in the low $30 for mine and I think knew it was sold for between $12 and $15. But honestly, to me, I felt it was worth it to pay that. I wouldn't have wanted to pay much more. But paying that much, I'm, it's, it's totally cut down on me having jars that don't seal and things like that. So um, it's been worth it for me. So I'm going to go ahead and get all these jars into the canner and then we're just going to can them for meat times. So for pints, that's going to be 75 minutes. Basic process for canning. We're putting them in the canner cold. I'm going to turn my burner on. Like I said, I'm going to start it off low. We're going to warm it up until we see steam coming out of the vent on the top and vent it for 10 minutes. And after 10 minutes, I'm going to put my weight on. And then as soon as it comes back up to pressure and that weight starts rocking, I'm going to time my 75 minutes. So let's go ahead and get these going. All right, there they are. I'm going to go ahead and put a lid on this and then I'm going to get this turned on and get this going. So now we have these eight beautiful jars of chicken teriyaki ready for our pantry shelves. But I'm going to go ahead and open one up right now so I can show you how this serves up. Okay, so like I promised, I'm going to open up one of these jars and we're going to fix it up. Now of course, it does have um, the little bit of fat from the chicken is going to be on the top and that's absolutely fine. We get something to scrape this jar because I want every bit of that sauce. I'm going to go ahead and bring this on over to the stove. 
and just get this turned on on medium high heat and I'm just gonna get this warmed up okay so now that we've got this nice and hot and steamy and simmering um, this is just about ready to serve so I've got some rice on and let's get this plated up okay so I made up some rice in my favorite rice cooker just a little bit of rice And now let's go ahead and dish out the chicken teriyaki. Look at how beautiful that looks. And finally, I'm just gonna give this a little sprinkle of sesame seeds. Now this is really just for looks, it's not necessary, and I almost never do this when we're just having dinner, but to make it look good today, I'm gonna put the sesame seeds on. You could also do some chopped green onion or whatever else you wanted. Okay guys, let's try it. Mm. that is so good that is that is delicious this is my favorite thing that I have canned so far and this is definitely going to be making some repeat appearances now this canned teriyaki chicken would also be great for making an emergency meal kit or meal in a bag if you're not familiar with my emergency meal kits I have a playlist of these that I'll put down below for you to check out the idea behind these kits is that you have these bags ready to go, and each bag contains everything you need to prepare a complete dish or a complete meal, right down to any water that you need to prepare it. These kits are perfect for emergencies because you can just grab a bag and know that you have everything you need to create a complete meal for your family without having to open your refrigerator if the power's out and without having to search all over to pull together all the different ingredients that you need. It's easy and it cuts down on your stress. But these are not only good for emergencies, but they can also come in handy anytime you need a quick and easy meal. You got home late, you forgot to stop at the store, you forgot to thaw the meat, you forgot to plug in the crock pot, whatever the case may be. Or maybe you just need your teenager or your spouse to cook the meal, or you want to bring a meal to someone, but you want it to be something that they can eat when it works for them and not something that they have to eat right away. There's lots of times that these can come in handy and that also helps ensure that they stay rotated and nothing gets old just sitting there waiting for a power outage or other emergency. Now this is how I would put this together as a meal in a bag. Now these are the bags that I typically use. Um, I have two sizes of these and this is the smaller bag and I do put a label on the end. If there's an actual recipe um, involved with the meal in a bag, I'll put a recipe card here, but this is just heat and eat. This is not gonna be a recipe. So what I'm gonna put in this bag is obviously I'm gonna put a can of our teriyaki chicken, and I'm gonna put a package of rice. This is the already cooked rice. It just needs to be heated. Now typically you would heat this in the microwave, and if you've got power, you can use the microwave, but if you don't, you can always open it up and put it into a pan, or you can even put the whole package into um, a pot of warm water and heat it that way. And then for side dishes, I'm gonna have a fruit and a vegetable. And then for fruit, I was going to have pineapple because that always seems to go with teriyaki to me. And for a vegetable, I am going to use broccoli because that's what I always serve with our chicken teriyaki is broccoli. Now, obviously, I'm not going to put this whole um, gallon size can of broccoli in. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put um, another pint jar with the broccoli into my bag because that will be the perfect amount of broccoli. Now, of course, you can put whatever amount of these things that you want. If your family's larger, you can use two jars of the chicken, two pouches of the rice, um, you know, whatever that you need. I, I personally, for myself, will probably use um, two, can, two jars of the chicken and two pouches of the rice. All right, so I've got my two cups of broccoli. Now, I'm going to seal this up with this um, canning-style lid. And so this is going to be airtight. So this should stay fine in here for at least a year. Um, if I were planning on leaving this set on my shelf for any longer than that, I would probably put a small oxygen absorber inside of this jar. But this will be fine for at least a year. And I'm sure I'll use it up before then. You can see here um, what the broccoli looks like. It's just broccoli. This is freeze-dried broccoli. What I love about this is being able to have... Um, you know, shelf-stable broccoli. I can actually have broccoli sitting on my shelf. Mmm, and it is so good. Mmm, God, that's good. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and build my bag. 
I'm going to go ahead and put in the chicken. I'm going to go ahead and put in the pineapple. I'm going to go ahead and add this jar of broccoli. And of course, I'm going to add our pouch of rice. And then the one other thing that I am going to add that I didn't mention is I'm going to add a bottle of water. And this is for refreshing the broccoli. It won't take this whole bottle of water. It'll take less than a cup of water probably to refresh this broccoli. But um, so if I actually had a smaller eight ounce bottle, I could put that in here, but I don't have one right now. I'm just going to put in the full size bottle and that's going to be fine. We can have a little bit of extra water left over if we need it. That could be drunk or used for washing up or anything like that. All right, so here it is. Here's our meal in a bag, all ready to go. There is the um, label. And that is so if I set it on the shelf like this, like a book, I can read what's in it and easily pick the bag that I want. I love having these meals in a bag ready to go. They're super useful. Like I said, they're great for emergencies, but we also use them at other times and they're really great. So I will put on um, my playlist that has all of my emergency meal kits down in the video description for you in case you're interested. Okay guys, that was how I canned up our favorite teriyaki chicken. And I'm so glad to have these on my shelves. I'm going to be canning up a few batches of this every time I find these boneless, skinless thighs for a good price. I hope you enjoyed this video. Don't forget to leave us a big thumbs up down below to let us know. And if you made it all the way to the end of the video, leave me a chopsticks emoji down in the comments. And next, check out this playlist up here to see a whole different kind of meals in a jar. I'm Jarrah with Wicked Prepared. Survive today, thrive tomorrow. See you next time.